Um, and, th and thank you for coming. And I have had apologies from Mrs. Day, who represents Health Watch on this committee, but Carol is here, and I'm going to invite her to the table to represent um, Health Watch this morning. And as is traditional at these meetings, we'll just go around the table and do a brief introduction. So, Avril, can I start with you, please? <laughs> um, Avril Mumford, lead member for Children's Services. Ben Barrett, I'm the uh, senior manager for finance and resources. Limpler, my children's social care manager. Keith Grosset, senior officer for children. Linda Todd, head teacher, Five Island School. <laughs> Colin Taylor, police sergeant, St Mary's. Councillor Ted Molson. Uh, James Francis, councillor for St Mary's. Uh, Amanda Martin, councillor for St Mary's, chairman of council. Molly Peacock, Councillor for Snagness. Carol Clark, Manager for Health Watch. Colin Shorthouse, Careers Southwest. Alison Cook, Associate Director of Children's Services. Joel Williams, Senior Officer, Health and Wellbeing. Rachel Greenlaw, Financial Reporting Officer. Mike Harley, Interim Accountant, Children's Services. Ashling Hicks, Senior Manager. And I'm Chris Savile, elected member, chair of this committee. And in the back row, we have Andy Thomas, who is our committee secretary. So thank you very much. We move on to the agenda, declarations of interest. Could I have your declarations? Chairman? Um, anything that concerns Five Island School, as my son works there. Thank you. Uh, catch the front. I have uh, two children at the Five Island School. Oh, I don't think you need to declare <laughs> universal service. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, yes, number 14. Uh, on one of the policies, we run the boat, uh, a boat service. Yeah, thank you. Vice Chairman. Um, Stepdaughter and her husband uh, both work at the school. Thank you. Joel. Item 11 refers to staff at the Children's Centre, and I have a family uh, represent representation there. Thank you. And I should declare that my um, sister is currently a governor at the school. Thank you. Item two, minutes of the previous meeting. Held on the 30th of June. Anybody, any corrections that need to be made? If not, can I have a proposal that they are a correct record? I'll propose. Thank you. Second. Second. Lovely. All in favour, please show. Thank you very much. Sorry, Chairman. Just as a bit of housekeeping, if you've got one of these with two buttons, you press the one that's got the speaking action on it, and that will light your mic up. If you've just got the one button, you just press it and speak. Thank you, Andy. So the minutes have been carried. We move to item three, urgent items. To my knowledge, we have no <coughs> urgent items, but one of the policies, are, um, including in item 14, the gifted and talented policy is being removed from the agenda today. It needs some further work. Therefore, we move to part one, reports requiring decisions, and item four, um, verbal updates from partners. Um, this is always a very valid um, item on the agenda as it um, allows all of us to understand what partners have been doing over the last few months. So perhaps, Lynn, may I start with you? Or are yours all contained in your reports? Yours, Keith? Linda, head teacher. I'd just like to take the opportunity to uh, note that we recently had the Careers Convention and to thank the local community and businesses for the support that they gave um, to that very successful event for our young people. Thank you. Sergeant Taylor. Yeah, a brief one really. Devon Cornwall Police are introducing a new way in which we are uh, recording uh, information from vulnerable people. We're including together vulnerable children with vulnerable adults. Uh, it's called a, a VIST, a vulnerable vulnerability screening tool. Um, and in essence, it shouldn't change the way uh, things are dealt with, but we need to work out our processes on silly to, to tie it in with the adult and child social care in particular. Thank you. Um, can I move round to Carol? Do you wish to say anything? Do you want to? 
Uh, we've finally completed the community survey report from the household survey that we ran in April. Uh, we've shared any comments about children's health services and children's services with the relevant providers. And yesterday it was completed and sent to, um, the, the, the full report was then sent to commissioners and providers. Um, on children's health and children's services generally, we got very few comments. That's not unusual. We don't hear um, from families about children's services that much. And when we do hear from them, they usually seem to be quite satisfied. There were one or two points about access to CAMS or consistency of delivery of CAMS, uh, which Cornwall Foundation Trust have picked up. Thank you very much for, uh, for that. Uh, Mr Shorthouse, and welcome to your first meeting of the Thank Children's you. Committee. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we, we provide the, the careers advice and guidance in the school and also to young people in the community. Um, main points to report are that the government has a September guarantee, which is offering every young person a place in learning, and that was met for this year, so everybody had an offer of a place in learning. Tim Moody's work in the school continues, and he reports back that's going very well. He also echoed your positive comments about the careers fair, which is going very well, so those are the main points of activity at the moment. Thank you. Uh, Alison, do you wish? Morning. Uh, yes, I noticed that there isn't anyone else from Cornwall over here, so uh, the commissioners haven't obviously been able to make it. I see that there is an ad agenda on about the transformation of CAMS, so I can talk about that at the time with yourself yes. at that time. Otherwise, um, we're still, um, CFT is still embarking on our integration program with Cornwall Council. We've opened what we're calling an early help hub last week which is where all referrals for children, regardless of whether they're for health or for um, the council, come through one front door. And um, we've got a meeting later with Ashling and um, Joel to um, try and see what we can also to replicate on the island, because obviously that isn't appropriate to have one in Cornwall for here. Um, so that's what we're working on currently. Thank you, and we look forward to hearing more about the item on the agenda when we, yeah. we get to that. Obviously, things are moving quite quickly. Yes, I'll, I'll just say it last, shall I? <laughs> which is good. <laughs> yes. Um, Joel, well, obviously, you have a report on the agenda, and obviously, our finance team do uh, as well. So, um, actually, is there anything not on the agenda that you wish um, to? Just a reminder about the safeguarding conference tomorrow, which will we um, have speakers talking about female genital mutilation. Um, fabricated and induced illness and presentation of bruising in children. So we've got some quite illustrious people coming over, so I hope you can all make it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all. Uh, we move to item five, update on decisions made in previous meetings. Um, this is a very short report and uh, written by K Keith. Do you wish to speak to it, Keith? Only very briefly, Chair, thank you. Um, it is a very short report because not many of the up actions from the last meeting required an update. No. Uh, the significant point is the changes to Cornwall's proposed state, Cornwall status in terms of devolved funding and its responsibilities with health commissioning and social care commissioning. There's put on hold significant amounts of work, I understand, uh, but separate to that, CAMS commissioning will be carrying on forward. But that's Thank the only. You. Thank you. Do you wish to add to that last item at all? I, um, I just want to reassure um, everybody that we are involved in that process, and so even though it's very kind of a Cornwall-led position, nothing can be done without the kind of say-so of Silly, um, because the NHS obviously is statutorily uh, required to provide services on the island. So we're making sure we're at the top table, and we're also talking to Alison um, after this meeting about current provision. So nothing's stopping. Thank you very much. I think that's obviously a huge amount piece of work to be taken forward, but it is important that we are all confident that our voice on the Isles of Sydney is actually being heard. So um, thank you for that. Um, the recommendation is just to note um, the update on the decision, so I don't think we really need a proposal for that. So we move forward to item six, um, <clears throat> budget monitoring, report to... Um, August the 31st. I have to say that I'm actually delighted to have some budget information before us today. Um, and I do thank um, the finance team uh, for bringing them forward. And um, I would ask, uh, is it Ben, are you taking us through it? Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the budgets presented here before you are 
brought on an exception basis, and so therefore cost centres with a, a variance exceeding 5k are presented in, in the attached report. Um, following previous committee, other committees, we have expanded some of the detail here to provide a greater narrative and breakdown of, of what is actually happening. Um, we are on a journey with our budget monitoring. We are trying to resolve a lot of issues in the system, and we have made some, some good progress. Um, we are embarking on quite a big project at the moment in redoing our budget process completely um, with the finance team. Members will be involved and uh, for most of the process, and we are having a medium-term financial plan planning day on the 1st of December, which will shortly be coming into diaries. Um, that will also encompass our budget monitoring um, and the way we report, working with budget holders and chairs and vice chairs of committees to, to try and expand how we budget monitor to improve our disclosure in this and to, to present something that's more, of more use to the committees. So it's not by way of any apology um, for the work here, but there, there are some variances here that uh, are quite easily explainable. But uh, that is just some of the background that we are going through at the moment um, and the, the team is working on. So I'd be delighted to take any questions on the actual content of the, the budget monitoring, if you so wish. Are there any questions from mem any members or our partners at all? <coughs> I think, you know, I have to say, it is quite, it's very well explained. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Vice Chairman. Um, I'm glad to continue the safeguarding budget for children, young people, and we do hope to protect this for the coming year. Thank you. I mean, I think um, the good news is, uh, in 2.2, um, the underspend shown currently at this time of the year. I mean, obviously, you know, we're only a short way into the financial year, and there are things to be paid out of that money, but um, at least we've got thus far with a considerable underspend, so that's good. Um, so if there are chairman, council. Yeah, well, I'm happy to propose this and to endorse your comments about the, um, having the financial information at this stage and um, long may it continue. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Um, can I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Mr. All in favour, please show. Thank you. It's carried. Nobody against. In which case we move to item <coughs> six. It's page 11 on our... Sorry, item seven, um, capital and revenue position statement, page 25 in our pack. And I would thank, like to thank Mr. Mike Worley for putting this together. He's been working specifically on um, children's budgets and the school budgets over the last few months now, is it? Mm -hmm. And um, although, and this is a very comprehensive report, I have to admit, it took me about three or four times to read it through before I got to grips with it, but to, um, I have got to grips with it. And you know, at the bottom, you know, it is good to know where we currently stand, and that is the important part of this um, document. Um, so, Mike, would you like to, just to speak to it, please? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yes, I was asked to prepare a position statement uh, detailing uh, the position on reserves attributable to uh, children and young people services, as well as um, an update on the position on the uh, section 251, which is the, as you know where, the statutory return that the authority has to produce twice a year, detailing the budget and the outturn on uh, education and children's services. Uh, part of this is, the reason for this is that it's a very arcane document that any of you have actually tried to look at it. It's very difficult. It's quite complex to produce. And to be fair, uh, it hasn't always been produced with the same degree of accuracy as, as perhaps it, one might have wished in the past in this authority. Anyway, the position as at the end of 1415 financial, which was the, the latest complete year, uh, in in uh, summary, the level of earmarked balances available to the committee are revenue 555,000 and capital 385,000. Those are healthy, 
by any, any stretch of the imagination. <coughs> However, um, a lot of the revenue reserve is earmarked to meet significant cost pressures coming through in this and subsequent financial years. So it's not free money in any sense. So speaks a typical accountant, <laughs> <laughs> treasurer. <laughs> and, and, and the capital balances are there to, to meet the, the pressures on, on uh, people numbers and also uh, one or two other projects which are, are in the pipeline. Uh, coming to the uh, education grant, as, you, as you're aware, the Isles of Scilly are unique in that they don't get dedicated schools grant from the government, they get a specific grant called the Isle of Scilly Education Grant. Uh, in all respects, it has to be treated the same as dedicated schools grant, but it can be used to fund expenditure of a much wider definition than dedicated schools grant. And it's quite important, uh, that uh, definition of that difference. Uh, what is, and also we are required to report as a specific uh, note to the accounts how we have disposed of the education grant during the year. Now, in, for various reasons, which are what are under the bridge now, this hasn't been done particularly accurately in the past. I've taken the chance, the opportunity to go back and recast to see where we really stand. And this paper shows where we really stand. <clears throat> in 2013-14, I had to go back and recast the whole um, uh, Section 251 return. And the, we underspent against the grant in the year, mainly through the deployment of previously uh, unspent earmarked grants. So there was, there was grants in the balance sheet which came out to part fund activities and enough was brought out to make the overall underspend. <clears throat> in 1415, uh, there was an overspend against the grant, <clears throat> mainly due to a couple of, of uh, abnormal and uh, unique uh, items of expenditure, which will not be repeated. Uh, however, <clears throat> Correcting for those, the underlying levels of expenditure show a, a, a reduction of about 2.5% from the previous year, which is in the right direction and <coughs> uh, follows the actions taken to reorganise the department, etc., during the year. In 1516, the authority is, is budgeting for a marginal underspend against their education grant. Uh, and that marginal underspend is going towards the reserves for future pressures. That, in a nutshell, is where we stand. The, the detail is, is in the report, and I'll quite happily answer any specific questions. The trouble is, it, it's, it's a bit dense. I have to apologise for it. It is a bit dense, but it's a dense subject. So, if there are any questions of clarification or of fact, I'll be happy to answer them now. Councillor Milson. Yeah, the only concerns that I've got with it is the uh, it, it is on page eight of the report on the new school build, the video conferencing, and the Moorwell footpath. I was actually part of the new school build yes. uh, project board, and these were originally supposed to be time limited. And uh, according to this, nothing's been done about it. Yeah. Have we got? any progress with that or are we likely to get any progress with it? Yeah, the I think it's explained a little bit more in item 8, yeah, um, that, Ted. It any, any no, I think the money is still available and I think um, most of the Morewell path has been completed with other money, so that money is still, and I think there needs to be a dialogue with the school uh, how this money is going, you know, if they still want video yeah. conferencing or if things have moved on, etc., etc. The money should still go, you know, to, yeah, to provi provide for the Five Island School and not be consumed no. by anything else. <laughs> I'm just we? happy to confirm that we are working on the video conferencing at the moment, getting quotes in, etc. I think our needs have developed slightly since the original um, idea was put forward. Um, and we're hoping that, in fact, it will be um, within the next financial year that that's all put in place. I assume it's a different technical spec to the original yeah, one that you have got in the first instance. That's right. Yeah. Fine. Technology's moved on. Yeah. <laughs> and it'll move on again. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, so that money is still available for the school, you know, for the use of the school. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any further questions? No, I, as I say, this, you know, as Michael said, it's a bit of a dense report, but it's actually vital for us to move forward as a committee and develop our services to meet the needs of the children in the community that we know where we are financially. Um, so could I just have a recommendation that we accept this report? Thank you, Chairman. I, thank you. All in favour, please show. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now, having spoken about the money and where we stand we move to item eight and we have a report on capital and revenue development plans and uh, this is presented by senior manager services to our community Ashley. okay well hopefully this is um fairly self-explanatory and really cannot um, express our gratitude to our finance colleagues no. for giving us exactly what there is available so that we can actually now make the plans to spend it because obviously we shouldn't just hold money in savings accounts um, in terms of revenue, you will remember that historically we've always held back a pot of money to fund um, specialist placements for children that need it. And because of knowing our school population so well, we've been able to plan ahead um, and make sure that we can provide the best possible provision um, in line with that child's needs. Um, so I recommend that we continue to do that. Um, and we have some quite healthy reserves, but obviously we'll keep watching that position and we'll come back to you if we've got any concerns about um, in-year budget pressures. Um, in terms of capital, um, thank you, Councillor Molson, for raising um, the new school build um, uh, grant conditions, because obviously I was on the project board with you. Um, more well has been done. Um, there might be a few little bits that need doing, but nowhere near the amount of money that sat in reserves. Also, video conferencing, because technology has moved on, is likely to come out much more cheaply. So again, those conditions were set by you know, a kind of new, new school bill, so I might come back to members and say, can we relax those conditions and use the rest of it towards the overall kind of works programme for school? So we'll, we'll kind of watch this space, but I don't think we're going to need as much as we've got held there. And because we don't need to go to the department, I don't know, it might be an easier job to move that money around. Um, I think the key thing is to look at school capacity for the future and make sure that we maintain our buildings in the way we want to. So we're about to commission condition surveys of the whole school estate including Mundersley, so that will give us a basis of what do we need to do, how are we going to accommodate this bulge year that we have every now and then, um, and um, you know, prepare for the future. So that, again, we'll bring back a more detailed report, I would hope, by the next committee, actually, so you can see some more detailed plans, and we're doing that in conjunction with school, obviously. Any questions to the report? No, it's quite straight, but we do have a recommendation to approve the outline proposal for the investment, capital and revenue reserve in children's service. Can I have a proposal? If people, thank you, Vice Chairman. Thank you. Second. Right, all in favour, please show. Thank you. I mean, for us, it must, it's really encouraging that we, do, we are able to look to the future without, with, with some comfort really that there is some money in the pot <laughs> <laughs> but we haven't had our spending review till uh, what money we're getting next year till de December so it could be a different story <laughs> but we live in hope and expectation um, item 9 children and young people's plan update we have a report from uh, senior officer children Keith would you like to talk to this certainly thank you this is the first monitoring a, first first time we've been around the monitoring cycle for the children yes. and young people's plan I've rag rated the items in the plan in terms of progress and things that haven't necessarily started or things that are actually a barrier to activity are highlighted in red. Things that we feel are embedded and uh, in place are green and works in progress are on amber. So just to note that some of the red items where we have a youth support worker on, working on the mainland, we have some IT issues with her being able to FaceTime young people in their placements, which is uh, due to our ongoing IT protocols. Uh, we can now change the 121A note in here to a VST, which would be a slight technical amendment in uh, around safe children. And we're also starting to refocus our works around domestic abuse and the MARAC processes, which is work underway on, on the second first page. Over the page, uh, we've started our working in partnership with the RNLI. Can I, so, can I just 
jump in. Yeah. Um, I'm not overly familiar with all the acronyms. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, haven't got a, I haven't got a clue what MARAC is <laughs> or MASH or whatever. Okay. Can, you, can, you, can you please explain yeah, okay. as you're going along? Okay, a MARAC is a multi agency. Risk assessment conference. Risk assessment conference. <laughs> <laughs> I know what it is, but. Yeah, well. So there we go. It's, 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 a, it's around a, a domestic abuse support right. conference. Sorry, okay. Okay. A MASH is a multi agency safe heart. Safeguarding Hub, it's a body of professionals that meet together on a monthly basis to discuss safeguarding strategies. Okay, <laughs> I'll carry on. This. So the RNLI is the Royal National Lifeboat <laughs> Institute. <laughs> uh, we've started working with the RNLI uh, on a community safety plan for the islands, looking uh, with partners from all water users, including uh, the boatmen, uh, kayak, clubs, sailing clubs, in terms of raising a community awareness around water safety um, with an emphasis on um, open water swimming, kayaking, sub aqua activities, and also the use of personal life jackets amongst all water users, whether you're an adolescent in their rib or a seasoned pot puller, crab fisherman, whatever, you know, aiming to work along that line and ably supported with, uh, by Tess Lloyd who has helped agree to be the sort of local champion from the local authority for, for that project. Um, we're sorry, Keith, catch the peacock. Can, yes. sorry. can we ask questions as you're going along? Please do, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, please, please, do. Yeah. As we go along, Molly, that'd be yeah. fine. I'd like to know what you're doing for the off-island children then in regards to safety, please. If you're doing it through the RNLI. Specifically, um, so... so Okay, so uh, we're very early in early stages of the, of the project, but whatever is available on St Mary's will be available. We will endeavour to make available for children on the off island in terms of education and awareness raising, and also for looking for local champions to support good practice. Yeah. I think you ran something. Something was run in the summer in the holidays. Was it around water safety? Yes, uh, because I had very positive feedback from a parent on St Martin's about it, whose child had come down, and I got very f so yeah. that was good. So we're working in relation yes. with, yeah. with Tess and the, the yeah. Joel's team. Uh, the next uh, area for activity is uh, around about around e safety and parental awareness of e safety issues. We're planning a safeguarding event or activity to be in place, hopefully by Christmas where we can start addressing some of those issues with families and actually demonstrating to families that not just e-safety, safety in the home, drugs and alcohol awareness and those, those things. So we can demonstrate to families just how easy it is to actually put in parental controls on your home network and devices and actually look after your children in the same way as so you help them cross the road. Mm. Eventually, children need to be allowed to cross the road independently but, you know, as a responsible adult, you put in those safeguarding areas. And can I ask members, actually, especially with children, at the, you know, with children at the school, to actually promote this to parents? Because in, previously, um, we've had some, possibly not as good, but some a similar events, and the, t um, the attendance by parents has been quite minimal. Mm. But this is really important. <coughs> and, you know, so if, as, as we all as individuals actually promote this once it's advertised, it would be beneficial. Thank you, Keith. Um, over the page, the next uh, areas for red areas are around about raising awareness on risky behaviours that adolescents may become involved with. Um, we we and hope to uh, gather uh, some baseline data on how risky, how much risky behaviour young people are partaking in. But we also need to be aware that teenagers are teenagers, and risky behaviour is part of being a teenager. Um, and that living in a goldfish bowl might not necessarily be the best place to be a teenager sometimes. So we need to keep a balance on that activity. Uh, over the page, uh, some of the work around health disorders and health, he eating disorders, sorry, uh, will be dealt with through the, the, the CAMS work that we're d d discussing later. And the other red areas are uh, around about uh, post-16 academic attainment and how we collect information from our partner schools and colleges 
is an area that has slipped over, this, over the last academic year or so. So we need to reinvigorate that activity by talking to our post-16 providers and actually getting some good quality data on where our young people go normally here with pretty good GCSEs and how they progress into 16, 17 and 18 year olds and A-level outcomes. Um, so that's an area for future work. Um, now are some other, other areas that I've read. The very last area that I wish to bring to your attention is on the bottom of the page 41 is around the wraparound provision and school, out of school activities for children and people. We had a very positive act, set of activities over the summer holidays that are being reviewed and that review will inform October half terms planning and provision. And Joel will be able to talk to that later, I'm sure, in the joint report. Right, thank you, Keith. Are there any um, <coughs> further questions? Obviously, we, only, we approved this plan in June, so it's really the beginning of the plan. And I think all of us should, would have expected to see some red yeah. within it after a few months, and it runs till 2017. So, mm -hmm. But i um, very pleased with the work that has been amber, and some of it has been completed. Councillor Mrs Peacock. Yes, thank you. It's very pleasing to read this. Could I just ask that you make it bigger? Yes. The print. It's very difficult <laughs> when you're reading it at night time um, to, to really see what you're reading and, and to take it in. It would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. We do have a recommendation that members note the progress made in delivering the app comes of the Children and Young People's Plan, 2015-17. Can I have a proposal, please? Thank you, Ted. Thank you. All in favour, please show. Did you have another question? Sorry, no, Colleen. I didn't. No. No. Thank you. Um, we move to item 10, Children's Social Care Update. Um, Children's Social Care Manager, Lynn. <coughs> Um, yes, just to say that the report that I've submitted is for information that what we've tried to do over the last few months is to focus on the quality of our work and the voice of the child and ensuring that the voice of the child is evident and the impact that we're actually having on children um, and trying to measure that. So the information I've given you hopefully will, uh, will help to support that, but um, it's there for reading. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, Vice Chairman? Um, yes. Um, on page 45, um, how, how are we going to improve this situation with the, um, with the smart? Down at the bottom here. Lack oh, and quality assurance, some recording, yes. not smart or structure. I think that the new electronic system that we've got is going to make a massive difference. Um, I think the audits that we've had, um, the evidence is that verbally um, we're having the conversations. The difficulty is having the technology and the time to actually accurately record and evidence the good work that we're doing. So that is, is a challenge for us. It's one that we're addressing and we keep on the agenda um, so that we can improve that. We're always um, open to ideas from other local authorities, which is why we brought in the peer challenge, um, to give us ideas about how we can do that. But yes, it is a challenge um, in having the time and the technology to be able to do that. Yes, and, and going on to the peer challenge on page 46, um, um, how are you going to how are you going to evidence the um, records that they haven't been consistent? Okay, again, the new system um, we've developed the system um, to incorporate a template and prompts, so that when, for example, we're doing supervision, that that template gives us a prompt to ask the questions, which provides the evidence. So. It is evolving, and what, the, what we were really pleased about is the, the peer auditor said that if she had seen some of the supervision records that she saw on Scilly in the authority in which she worked, she would have been very pleased, mm. and that she can see there's been immense progress over the last six months, and that there were some areas of outstanding practice, so what we need to do is we do know now that we know what good looks like, and we just need to make sure that we do it consistently. Mm. Mm. 
And the inclusion workers, you have three part-time inclusion workers. Is that enough? Because I noticed we've got 30 children on the books at the moment. Yes, the difficulty is with inclusion work is that for inclusion workers, you're dependent on people being able to work who aren't dependent on an income mm. because yeah. the work is casual, um, you can't guarantee hours, and mm. that's the difficulty in that people are fitting that type of work in um, on top of another job, um, potentially, as well. So, um, we've, we're managing, we are managing to cover it at the moment, but we would always welcome um, new inquiries for inclusion mm. workers, because there are children who need particular activities with people who've got particular skills who would benefit from that. So we would always welcome new applicants. Yeah. And, and do we advertise for that all the time? There's a constant, um, constant uh, it's on yeah, the website, so, yeah. it's, a, it's a rolling programme of yeah. adverts. Yeah. Yes. And um, finally, um, the key challenges and barriers. Um, you say here there remains a reluctance to report concerns about child protection due to a fear of repercussions in the community. Um, how do you think you can get around that? How can you get parents to... I mean, it's, it's, it's a small place, isn't it? And they're reluctant to say if they think a child is, is under some sort of pressure or being abused, to come forward in a small place. Absolutely, and that, that is one of the challenges. I think that um, there are a number of ways we can do that. We are putting out some training for um, all council staff and um, council members on the signs and symptoms of abuse because firstly a community has to understand what does abuse look like. Um, sometimes things happen that people think are acceptable when maybe they're not. So we need to help people to understand that. I think the other thing is to um, make sure that people understand that children's social care are there to support families to deal with issues and to help to keep families together. I think there's um, a misconception that children's social care, when they get involved, means that we're looking to remove children. That is not the case. We look at strengths in families, um, as well as the challenges, so that we can work towards helping them to make their family safer. Um, we are starting to get a lot of positive feedback from families who we've been involved with. Um, I think that it is about education, it's about word of mouth, but there is still that problem of living in the goldfish bowl. Mm. We are also setting up um, a young ambassadors group, which um, we're getting volunteers um, from young people who've been involved with children's social care um, to talk to us about how it was for them, what would have made it easier for them to be involved, what worked well and also to um, design a leaflet and information for other young people about what it's like to mm. work with children's social care. That's because the voice of the child is very important, Absolutely. isn't it? And, and <coughs> early intervention. Absolutely, yes. Thank you, Avril. That's the answer. I'd just like to continue on that theme slightly. There's a section just below the table on page 45 that uh, says that referrals in July um, increase and then there's a significant decrease in referrals on child protection issues in August. Um, child protection issues in August won't be going away. Absolutely. Is it just that we've not got the mechanism to pick them up or...? Um, the main referrer of any um, child to children's social care is through school. Is there That's any, where the majority there, of our referrals th come That from. I understand, but is there not a contingency during school holidays that there is a potentiality to pick these up. I know that's a $95,000 question and could be extremely expensive. However, child protection issues aren't going to go away in August. Um, they're going to be there just as prevalent as the rest of the time of year. There's no time, timings on those. Uh, it just concerns me that there is absolutely no referrals at all in August, that, the, uh, that there is a potentiality for mischief, stroke, danger to children. Absolutely. That figure is probably reflected right across the country. It's not, it's not just here, and that is because um, a lot of the child protection referrals do come from schools because children have relationships with school teachers that they're familiar with and they feel safe with, so they're able to talk to those people. Yes, there is um, a worry about what happens in the summer, but I think that we are now working together better with um, early help, children's services, and um, uh, Tess as well, to look at more activities. So we're actually providing more activities for children, which means that they are more visible. 
um, we're increasing the staff ratio so that if they um, need to talk to some way or someone or there are concerns, that there are more people around during the summer to be able to pick up those issues. Are we likely to put any mechanism in place where the, the children's voice can be heard easily during the, during the school holidays? Uh, obviously, the children's voice at the moment is much more easily heard during term time with uh, members of staff at school and what have you, but it seems to me as though there is a perceived or potential barrier in the school holidays for the protection issues to go underground. But that, that brings me back to the challenges and barriers of the community. So every person in the community has a responsible to keep a child safe. It's not just school teachers. So that's what we, that's the challenge for us is, um, is getting the whole community see, to see it as their responsibility to make sure that children are safe so that they will report things in as well. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is what, what we're worried about is that when people do that, because people who they may be concerned about are also neighbours, friends, work colleagues, that makes it harder for them to do because they're worried about the consequences. So children's social care need everybody's help to make sure that we keep children safe. It's not just the responsibility of children's social care. Can I urge you to get that message out into the community Absolutely. stronger than it already is? Absolutely. Uh, I was just going to add as well that we do do a lot of work in school in, in ensuring that the children themselves have a voice so that they know how they can get help at any time. Um, so we would hope that that would work through holidays as well. And I, I know that they won't necessarily take the initiative to do that, but that piece of work, I think, does support this. And the concern is the fact that there's no referrals at all in August. And that, that's where the, you know, that, that is a red light, really, that is flashing yeah. quite brightly. Yes. But I think with extra activities, there are then more profes other professionals around with the children that they can confide in and professionals can ob observe. So, um, yeah. Uh, that is one way of overcoming it, but uh, more can always be done. Alison. I would just like to say we have exactly the same pattern in, Cor in Cornwall. We have a real spike at the end of term, and we get a huge... One of our busiest times of year is January after Christmas, for exactly mm. the same reason. Yeah. Everyone sort of disappears into homes over Christmas and then afterwards all the tensions and everything else. It often I just back. reiterate that what I said is that, that the safety issues aren't time limited as far as terms are concerned. So this is obviously not just a, a, a problem as far as Silly is concerned, it's a problem, a national yeah. problem by the yeah. sound of it. Yeah. So therefore we ought to be feeding back up the line that this is something that ought to be taken on not only by us, but by regions and national government as well. I think we are actually at an advantage over some of the um, communities on the mainland in the fact that because we are so small, we also are more visible, but that's why we want to use the opportunity of the community safety conference um, before Christmas to make sure that the more people know about the signs and symptoms of abuse and the more people that know um, what to do about that, then hopefully we can reduce that, that drop in, um, in August and make sure that it's a whole community response. Thank you. Are there any... Yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, was just, I just had one question. Um, there isn't anything in here about transition, and I know there's a real focus, particularly in CAMS, around transition, and I just wondered if that was not an issue for you here, um, because I'm sure it must be in a different way to how it is in Cornwall. Transition to adults? Yeah. Yes. I brought the, um, some information about that at the last committee meeting. We talked about that. We're working very closely with our partners in adult services to make sure that they are involved and are aware of children from the age of 14. Um, we're working together on the transition to adulthood policy, making sure that we take into account the CARE Act requirements as well. So yes, we're actually working quite closely together and we've got a good view of who is coming up. We, we know the individuals. That's good because um, we're doing quite a bit of work on it as well, so maybe we can think that up. So. Thank you, Alison, and thank you, Lynn. I mean, as you rightly said, this <coughs> paper is only for information, but I think it is an important paper because it does highlight the work that you're doing in your department. It does have a huge impact on the um, families and the, uh, the potential of the children involved. So well done for all that you are, you are doing. And I think sometimes, certainly, and I've read many of these now, the numbers actually do 
surprised me of the number of people using the service. So I think it is important that members are aware of that, and you know, especially when, again, we come to looking at our finances. So thank you very much. Um, we move on to item 11, Children's Wellbeing Activity Report. Um, Gerald's here to present this, and again, um, this is just for information and for comment, but again, it highlights the work that is being done for the children and young people in our community, um, again, to keep them safe and to give them opportunities and to help them reach their potential. So thank you, Joel. Thank you, Chairman. Um, some of the projects um, highlighted in the report this morning have already been alluded to, so perhaps I can put a little bit more flesh on the bone in some certain cases. Um, I wanted to draw attention as well to some of the continual professional development opportunities which have been afforded to uh, multi-agency staff, particularly around mental health. Um, our youth MP gave a very articulate presentation at our last committee meeting yeah. where she highlighted her desire to improve mental health services and to reduce stigma. We're going to talk about it a little later in the agenda as well. There have been two um, mental ill health training sessions delivered over the past few months, both very well attended. Um, we've also had some domestic abuse training. Again, there's another visit scheduled for next Monday um, to, again, support um, our knowledge and understanding of the services out in, out in Cornwall to, to serve us as well. We had a fascinating um, Raising Awareness of Autism session as well, which I think was very well received. And Pinhaligan's friends were over last week talking about some of the work around bereavement. Um, we've spoken about holiday activities, um, and two in particular were around supporting safety for children and young people in our community. Um, the Water Safety Project was uh, one example of that, which we've mentioned, and that was very much being down on the beach and up at the swimming pool, building rafts and doing some of those activities. Again, raising awareness of the dangers of water, but also the bikeability, what used to be the cycling proficiency, again, was very well received. So that was improving road safety and was sponsored by the Community Safety Partnership, um, and 56 children, I think, took part in that. So again, hopefully that sort of sent some positive messages to, to homes about road safety, and we'll be looking to remind people about the importance of using bike lights as the evenings draw in in the coming weeks. Um, and during the October holidays, we're also looking to repeat that bikeability session. There was, there's obviously times where people are away during the summer holidays, so we'll be doing another couple of sessions over between now and the next committee meeting on that. Um, I think there's been improvements in terms of the integration between the deli delivery and planning of some of the activities for children and young people. There's still lots we can learn, so we're still looking to review some of the activities over the coming weeks to see where improvements can be made. Um, but it was pleasing to see the number of off-island participants who were able to take part in some of the activities. And again, that sort of uh, integration between the sort of well-being work we're doing and children's services is also reflected in some of the work with adult services as well. So there was a trip that young people did to the mainland, but to earn their place, they had to participate in some activities down at Park House, again, doing some work down in the, um, the grounds there. So again, I think that sort of just brought some um, intergenerational work together. Um, some of the other activities mentioned in here refer to childcare, which Keith might be better prepared to speak to me in terms of new regulations that are coming together. But again, there seem to be positive messages around um, the work the child minders are doing and general childcare opportunities on Scilly. Um, I would just like to say that I attended the workshop on um, autism and it was a very interesting and when I went to one of the off islands and came across um, a child with autism it was a very useful thing to come across very good any more Councillor Mrs Peacock um, <clears throat> yes it, the services this summer were much improved what we find very difficult, and I think social services took it up, I'm not quite sure who did it, but there are, there's activities for children in the morning, there's activities for children in the afternoon, there's no, nothing at lunchtime for mm. people to look after those children, mm. and you can't send children down, from, you know, younger children down mm. from the North Island mm. and leave them on their own for an hour. If the parents have got to come down and, and get them for lunchtime to take them to the afternoon one, it defeats the object of why they're sending their children because they are paying for it. So, um, and I think social services did come in and uh, do some childcare during the day, and we're very grateful for that. And thank you. 
<laughs> Good point, Molly, and I'm sure Lynn will... That, that's one of the lessons we learned. We, um, we did provide um, lunchtime support for those children from off islands who needed to stay. We've learned our lesson from that, and certainly for the October half term, there is cover um, right through from 9am right through until the end of the day. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I think one of the things we're looking at doing um, for Easter and summer is to take a bit of a punt and look at doing full-time childcare for Easter and summer holidays. And you know that we've looked at this several times and the Holiday Club has looked at nine-to-one provision, but as you say, not all parents work just the mornings. But I think with the changes in universal credit and just the economic situation generally, I think we do need to do more to support working parents. And generally, as you know, Councillor Molson was picking up, these are ways of putting in protective environments for children. Um, so we're going to bring you a costly proposal on that about what it actually will cost to do that and actually have a full-time holiday provision next year. But there are all sorts of implications for that in terms of Ofsted registration and staffing and so on. But that is a real ambition of us. And then we'll see if we can make money on it. <laughs> Thank so you. sustainable rather than yeah. retire. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, James. Yeah, well, I, I would just like to say that I thoroughly support that. I think it'll be very useful to a lot of people, and I do hear, you know, people of my sort of, in my yes. kind of situation, we're young, yeah. talking about this an awful lot. But I'd also like to say that, you know, we are very encouraged, or parents or whatever, by, you know, these activities in the summer, you know, and the increase in the number of those, not only continuing, you know, from the after-school things, but... I don't think it was mentioned enough in, in, in the previous table that we looked at, the health benefits, you know, we mentioned healthy eating and so on, of the physical activities, the sporting activities through the summer. And increasing those is, is certainly a very good thing. And not only does it achieve that, but it's also helping with exactly what we were talking about, the yeah. matter discussed in the previous agenda. So it's all positive. Yeah. Thank you, James. And obviously, you know, you've got young children and mixing with parents with young children. Your voice is, you know, very welcome to representing them on this committee. So, you know, if they feed back to you, do feed it back to Children's Services. Thank you. Um, I would just like to say, and um, within the early years, I think I would like to publicly actually congratulate our childminders, because following inspection, they are either good or outstanding, and I think that's worthy of note. So I think um, we owe them a, a congratulations and a, a thank you. So um, are there any further comments on this report? Again, it's just for noting. No? So we move on to item 12, academic outcomes. 2014, 2015, um, again a report from our Senior Officer for Children, Keith. Okay, thank you. So this is a report in line with the LA duties to monitor school improvement functions and quality of outcomes for children and young people in school. Um, members will be aware that there are a, range, a number of measuring points through a young child's education progress from early years and foundation stage. Um, year one phonics testing, key stage one or year, key stage one assessment, key stage two assessment at the end of year six. And on outcomes, again, um, should read that results for speaking and listening, apparently, uh, apologies, not reading, are slightly below national averages, but not significantly. Uh, key stage two outcomes are where things become to get a little bit more interesting. Um, there's a the current education and adoption bill is working its way through the House of Lords at the moment, which sets out the definition of a coasting school and a set of more rigorous floor standards for key stage two outcomes and for key stage four outcomes. Um, previously, under the, the, the former floor standards, the key stage two outcomes would not be below those floor standards, but going forward with a floor standard of 85% of the cohort expected to be at level 4 plus in reading, writing and maths, uh, we are, for this year and also for last year, we have not met those floor standards. Um, at key stage 4, however, outcomes are significantly beyond floor standards and show <coughs> exceptional or very good high quality standards at key stage four. So we have a, a mixed picture of attainment in terms of key stage, early years and foundation stage 
being robust, key stage one being robust, key stage two being not as robust, and key stage four being good. So as a school improvement function, we'll be looking to work closely with the school to help smooth that progress curve across the piece to ensure that all children make attain as well as they could at the end of year six to just keep, you know, every child deserves the best of their best education, whatever age and stage they're in. Thank so you, I'm happy Keith. to take questions from that. Yeah. Vice Chairman. Um, key stage two. Um, what's the time scale for key stage two improvement? Okay, as, as I mentioned earlier, the Child, the Education and Adoption Act that's currently going through Parliament will look at a three-year historic bait, look back over the last three years. So from 2016, this, this academic year, it will then include this acad 15, 2015 and 2014 as, as included in the, in the, in the, in the date, baseline data. Um, so really, you know, the, time, the time frame is rapid, as soon as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else, everyone? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. That's for Mr. Peacock. Um, is it just this year that key stage two outcomes? No. <coughs> Excuse me. Is it just this year that key stage two outcomes are lower, or is it something that is running through the school from year to year? because you're going to get different academia levels of the children, aren't you? And we've got such a small cohort. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, we need to bear that in mind. When, when a, 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 a child in the cohort is equivalent between, to between 3 and 5% of the, of the count, two or three children suddenly becomes a 15% mm. drop below floor standards. Um, and I suspect that we would have that robust conversation with whoever with school improvement functions and with inspectorate to say, look, this is, we, we need to be able to track individual progress of individual children from EYFS to Key Stage 4 and be robust in each and every child's progress. Um, that said, when a desktop monitoring activity is taking place, you know, the percentages are there for people to, to pick up on, but we need to ensure there's an adequate commentary behind each, each, each number then. Yeah, and uh, children are different. There is a, a significant variation, but there's still a, got to be a desire to see every child make as much progress and reach their full potential. Linda. I was actually just going to emphasise what you've just said about um, the cohort size being so small and, of course, you know, uh, a couple of children can make a big difference. If you've got a couple of children with special educational needs in that cohort, then obviously that's going to impact. But I would also put context on these um, floor standards, which are actually proving to be quite controversial within education at the moment. Mm. To go from 60% up to 85% um, is quite significant. And as a consequence of that, a quarter of schools haven't managed to, to reach those mm. um, floor standards. And when you start comparing um, our performance against like schools, then um, the, the, the picture is not quite so um, drastic as such. Thank you. Um, Actually, oh. I mean, I would just say on, on I mean, cohort size is an issue, but we can't take the good news at key stage four and not have the bad, bad news yes. at key stage two because those things continue. And obviously, when we're looking at school improvement function, we'll triangulate it with all the information, all the conversations we have with Linda anyway, and also Ofsted. Um, who say obviously teaching and learning requires improvement. So it will all be part of a piece and it won't focus on one poor year group um, because that's not what we're trying to do but we're just trying to see what are the trends here and where are the areas for improvement because schools can always improve yes. and we are here to be constructive with school um, and not wave fingers. So I'm really glad to see some of the fantastic things. I'm glad to see that phonics has improved mm. and that's you know, a real win and that's been done rapidly and I think that's what we want to see. We want to see that pace um, and if you just think about what has been achieved by the governing body and the head teacher in the last 12 to 18 months, it's really impressive. But we're going to keep that going, you know, because we do, we need to see Key Stage 2 by the end of this year looking a lot different. Yeah. And can I just add, with regards to your comment on timescales and so forth, seeing the outstanding results with the phonics, yeah. that will have a significant impact on, for example, the SPAG really scores yeah. that go into Key Stage 2. Yeah. We're already seeing children in years 1 and 2 whose ability to spell is significantly better than it was, and that will have an impact. You know, just small things like yeah. that will make a big difference. Yeah. 
But as an authority, we are <coughs> responsible for school improvement. And um, I think in one of the budget sheets, you know, it implied that we would possibly be supporting the school um, with school improvement. Uh, putting more money into it, basically. Which, um, but we are here to work with the, the school and the governors and et cetera to allow every child to reach their potential. So um, that is the aim of all of us. That's why we sit here. Um, Councillor Molson. Just to pick up on something that Keith said, the, you said the bill's still going through the Lords uh, as far as these floor standards are concerned. It, it, is there a potential consequence if we don't um, achieve those floor standards, or is this just a, a guidance standard? No, my understanding of the consequence would be that uh, the regional schools commissioner would be taking an interest in the school with a uh, potential view for some level of support or intervention. Supported. Right. Support. It's not here, no, but you know the regional school commissioner would take a view. But it would be an interesting conversation where you have outstanding key stage four. You know, that would be a conversation to be had. But that's over the horizon. But on the right there. And I mean, I think the thing is that it's not that we don't welcome those conversations with the regional schools commissioner. And actually, the school is actively looking at kind of partnerships. I think the key thing is that you want to be in charge of that destiny. And the best way to be in charge of that destiny is to be good. Um, rather than have anything imposed, because you just have much better conversations. The Regional Schools Commissioner, he's got some really interesting thoughts, but we just don't want a one-size-fits-all approach to academisation or whatever we're talking about. We want to do it in the way that best suits the needs of our children here. So we just want to be in a strong position to do that. You know, the object behind the question was that what I didn't want was a situation where a potential special measures of a particular cohort or whatever it was, uh, I just wanted that yeah. reassurance that that isn't going to happen. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't benefit anyone. Uh, we've been there. <laughs> it's not fun. <laughs> We're nowhere near that stage, I just would like to say. But yeah. it's always good to make, you know, just to look into the horizon, yeah. Any further comments on this paper? No, well, I think we have reviewed and commented on it. Um, so, therefore, we move to item 13, transformation of CAMS. And, again, we have a report um, from the Senior Officer for Children, Keith. I'm presenting this report on... Very important, actually, report. <laughs> it is, yes. yes. And uh, I, I've been asked to present it on behalf of uh, Colonel Commissioner Jude Bowler, who couldn't be with us today. And I'll be looking to, for some support from colleagues as well. This is not an area of expertise or strength, so here we go. <laughs> um, Wing it, Heath, go on. I'll go. <laughs> Alice is here, don't worry. Uh, that's OK. So the idea is that the government came up with a future in mind strategy to transform CAMS provision for children and young people nationwide. On the back of that, there is, I understand, £5 million worth of funding over the next five years including this year, to transform provision, CAMS provision, across Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. Of that first year's transfer funding, 300-odd thousand has been allocated to uh, eating disorders work, and the significant bunch of additional funding is reliant on the governance approval of our own governance, approval of this transformation plan, along with Cornwall Health and Wellbeing Board's approval of the plan as well. So my understanding is also that timelines are tight and that um, we need to approve, ideally approve this plan and let Kerno know that we're happy with the, with the general gist and thrust of how CAMS provision will be transformed over the next five years and that will then draw, open the opportunities to draw down additional funding from central government to look at that. One, one significant thing that I thought quite pleased about was that uh, Kerner Commissioning have identified that, uh, a, a model called the Thrive model for intervention and support for children and young people with mental health issues. Um, it's quite similar to the plan that we came up with a while ago that's about en encompassing and uh, upskilling as many professionals as possible mm. who work with children and young people to provide support at the point of contact, whether you're a dinner lady, a sports coach, or a teacher, <coughs> that you provide a wraparound model of support for children and young people that draws on uh, expertise within the community that we will build 
build upon as we go forward. Is that the gist? I think. That's yeah. <laughs> And it's, Very encouraging, good. it's actually encouraging to know that some money is coming along <coughs> yeah. with it from central government. But Absolutely. Alison, yeah. But Alison, do speak to this. This yeah. is your... <laughs> um, it is extremely welcome that nationally it has been recognised that um, CAM services um, overall have been very underfunded for many, many years. So it is very, very welcome. As Keith said, um, the Future in Mind document is... Um, very welcomed and I think it's been overall um, seen to be a very useful and a very well written document not that all government documents aren't well written but this one <laughs> is particularly well written. There is five million pounds over five years as Keith rightly said there's a million pounds that needs to be spent by the end of March 300,000 of that is around eating disorders. Eating disorders is an area where um, there are definitely an increase in the number of eating disorders um, and there is not seen to be the specialist provision to accommodate children who are um, who need the high-end treatment but also we need to focus on the recognition and prevention as much as we can of eating disorders. The other 700,000 um, is particularly being um, focused on crisis care and infant mental health is another area where they want to see significant investment. The crisis care is complicated by the fact that we don't have any um, what used to be called tier four beds or um, any um, inpatient beds for children in Cornwall. Mm -hmm. Our nearest beds are in Plymouth. Um, those are often full. And we spend a lot of time spending, um, sending children as far as way as Kent and um, up north to Manchester and Birmingham, which is clearly unacceptable for a family, particularly further west you get. Um, it is very difficult to maintain relationships over long distances. Uh, and also it is difficult to do the facilitation for when the children are ready to be discharged. So the, the, the funding for Tier 4 beds um, is actually held by NHS England, just to complicate things, who are different to the CCG and the Council. Um, but there are <coughs> discussions going on around, um, and I know Cornwall Council is still very keen on um, bidding for a facility to be built in Cornwall. The crisis care is also about place of safety. It's about a 136 um, solution. We are lucky in Cornwall that we do have a 136 unit in Cornwall that um, takes children because some of our neighbours do not have that facility, which is causing a lot of difficulty. There is um, a welcome recognition that children should not be kept in police cells. I know in Cornwall this is not the case over um, quite a number of months, which is very welcome. But it's also about managing the escalation of mental health problems over evenings and weekends. We don't currently have a service that spreads into evenings or weekends. Also, um, because we don't have tier four beds, we heavily rely on um, Royal Cornwall Hospital to keep children in um, until beds become available. That is clearly very difficult for the hospital. The other focus around um, the future in mind is much more about prevention and early help. Um, one of the um, areas which is mentioned in here is a pilot of, um, called Bloom, which came out of a pioneer project which was um, initially started in Penwith. That is about the very, very early identification of illness or um, of issues with, to do with emotional health and mental health. Um, and this is particularly focused on schools and GPs. This is where your child um, may not need the assistance that comes through the services that, for instance, CFT might provide, but this is trying to um, identify issues early and be able to support children early so that we prevent an escalation into services. The Bloom Project has been very successful um, it was only done in one very small district council area 
um, but there is a willingness to um, extend that pilot across Cornwall, and it would be really useful to have um, something like that here. I, the interesting thing for me, it is very different here. We know that. Um, however, there have been, as Joel mentioned, some very useful um, education sessions around mental health here. And I think it's um, been recognised that um, we need to do a lot more than that because there seem to be more cases being recognised, not that there weren't cases before, more cases are being recognised. Some of those are escalating to mental health issues um, and we do need to have a discussion about how we prevent it at a low level. We've, you talked about the Thrive model in schools. There's also a complicated a Thrive model, which is different to the Thrive model in schools. It's a Tavistock model. I can't give you the... I'm not a mental health practitioner, but there, there is a difference. But it's also about um, how do we manage a crisis out of hours and at weekends when it's pouring with rain in the middle of November and foggy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's about not only building, there's a real focus on building resilience in children, but it's about community resilience as well to be able to hold and manage um, these cases when they come up. Um, we're looking at extending our services um, out of hours and at weekends. Um, and we're currently working very closely with the CCG and the council to see how we can spend this money this year. It's a very tight time frame. We've only really got about five months now, which is always, as, as you, uh, Chair, mentioned at the beginning of this, this is very rapid. Um, the initial plans had to be in a couple of weeks ago. There's another deadline at the end of this week. In a way, that's great because we're getting on with it. <coughs> However, it is also quite complex um, doing a wide-scale engagement mm -hmm. and getting everybody to agree on something, which is never easy. But um, we just have to go with it. I, you know, I suggest we won't have this opportunity again, so we have to spend this money very wisely um, as much as we can. Um, don't know if there's anything else I particularly wanted to say, we, as I say, we are meeting after, later this morning, to, to look at um, where we can do some planning, particularly f for ours of Scilly. Um, can't think of anything else if it comes into my head, but I'm, welcome, I'm happy to take any questions around it. Thank you, Alison. I mean, there's some of us around this table that have been talking about CAMS uh, over, over many years. Um, we had our youth member of Parliament, as Joel has referred to, speaking about mental health in the school at our last committee meeting. Carol has spoken about the only thing around children's services that's come out in the survey is around CAM. So, you know, hopefully we are moving in the, right, in the right direction and this will bring very positive outcomes. But I do sympathise with the timescales that you are working to. Uh, catch them all, Sam. Yeah, I've got a lot of positives from what you've just said and what have you. The, the one question I would ask is, that is there any of this money uh, allocated to any form of um, total coordination so that the police, social services, education, health are all coordinated in the correct direction so that the, the potential uh, problem, should it arise, goes to the right place rather than an inappropriate place? Uh, you're absolutely right. This money is for a whole system change. It's not just for health or social care. This is about a whole system, um, which is very welcome. And I think the other thing I didn't say is that what they're looking is, this is a transformation plan. This is, this is not a bit of extra money to carry on doing what we're doing now. We should be making plans to transform our services and do it very differently. A lot of that is around we should be listening to the child, wrapping services around the child. Um, I think the discussion we were having earlier when you were talking about the stigma and um, about how difficult it was to raise issues, is exactly the same for mental health. This is about whole-scale education for all services. Particularly for the coordination, as I mentioned earlier, in Cornwall, we've, um, myself and um, Jack Cordery, who's the head of social care over there, we came up with a plan to open an early help hub so every single referral for help 
goes to one front door. And the reason was that, because when you get that referral, you can think, who is the right person to deal with this need at this time? It doesn't matter who you work for, it doesn't matter who employs you, is what is the right service for the child at the right time? So that is why, I mean, it's only been open a week, but that was the concept behind it, that actually we all need to sit together. And in our early help hub, we've got the police, we've got a housing officer, we've got the troubled families, we've got health, we've got mental health, we've got um, locality services, um, we've got social care, and it's actually in the same room as the multi-agency referral unit. So if there's... Um, the inquiry that comes is, is clearly about safeguarding, then it goes to that end of the room. Conversely, if they get something in, in the Maru that needs to be early help, then they can just come down to the other end of the room. So it is about that communication and better um, organisation of services, because that is absolutely key. None of us have got the resources to manage a gold standard service on our own. We have to do it in an integrated way. In my view, that's it's the only way forward. So is the direction of travel towards a 24-hour-a-day service eventually? That is clearly the government's agenda, particularly in health. As you probably know, they want seven-day-a-week services. A lot of these services, mental health in particular, I would not advocate having 24-hour services most um, issues are raised before 10 o'clock at night. You do need a facility to, in the worst case scenario in mental health, section somebody or detain them under the Mental Health Act at 2 in the morning. That is very, very rare. So you do need the access to the right people who can do that, but most of the services need to be concentrated into the evenings and some at weekends. How we do that, I don't know because we haven't got that far, but you're right. Absolutely. But that is clearly where the national uh, drivers are going because there is very definite evidence that the outcomes for children and young people and adults as well actually are poorer if you come in at a certain day or time of the week. Thank you. Um, Carol. Hello. Um, <laughs> three, three things. Picking up on what you were just talking about and 24-hour access to services. Um, there's recently been an agreed protocol on um, crisis and adult mental health um, where local agencies and <coughs> mainland agencies are, are very clear who, who is the first person to contact, what happens next, how you get somebody uh, to be looked after safely and then transferred safely to the best place. Uh, that, that could be quite easy to do in terms of access to crisis care because we are so fortunate in having a small team who are all on call 24 hours. So they're there. Um, and as long as it goes through that <coughs> team and everybody knows what happens next, that should be workable. And I'm pleased to see that, that things like the Early Help Hub have been developed because for, for lay people who are not in the professions, knowing who to call is so important. But signposting in schools and in children's social care and health watch or wherever, to know who to call is, is very important. So I think that's good. Uh, local staffing on, in CAMS, we still have how many days a week do we have a children's mental health practitioner on the islands? Um, you have access as, as yes. many times as we're open. Mm -hmm pick up the phone, but actually people being here, I think it's two days a week. Currently it mm. was full time, but yeah. we um, reduced it in conjunction. It wasn't just so we've, we've, and is that we've So we've got a, a, a children's mental health practitioner who can tie yeah. into CAM services two days a week. I think the other difference is before we had um, a primary mental health worker, yeah. and this time we've got somebody who's mental health trained, yeah. so it's a CAMS worker. I think that's excellent. That's better than an adult. We ha don't have a single adult mental health practitioner, dedicated mental health practitioner on the island. <laughs> so I think that would be your, your, your key worker here. The council um, part fund that one, the, the yeah. children's one. Absolutely. And I yes. think that works because I think um, we, we have got a, a tiny, tiny bit of feedback through the survey about access. Mm -hmm. um, I think that improves access because you've got somebody here that can link into the other tiers. I know tiers are going, yeah. hurrah. Um, I, I think that 
it, it's more like consistency that once you're in the system, great when you can get it, but it's like everything else we hear about, there are huge gaps in ongoing treatment because practitioners can't get here and people can't get away. Mm. And so alternative ways of delivering sessions remotely, video conferencing, what have you, is really, really important to keep up that yeah. continuity. Um, that's what I've picked up from, from the last little bit around CAMS. There is something in the, um, um, the outcomes framework um, that Julia Day picked up when she read through all this, and it's around, it's on page 72, vulnerable children and young people get the support, care and treatment they need <laughs> and she's talking about hardly reached and most vulnerable, hard to reach and most vulnerable groups. Um, and earlier in, in Joel's report, um, there was reference to identifying carers, children, young carers. And there was some work done, there, there's, there's a nice group going now for sibling carers and activities for, for those young people. Nobody seems to have identified that there are any children and young people here who are caring for a parent. Julia's concern is that children might not easily identify themselves as carers in that role, but they might be doing a lot of that caring. And so she just wanted to, to, to say that it's doubly important that health and educational professionals are picking up on children in that situation, which I'm sure Lynn's going to respond to me about now. Yes, would you like to respond to that one, Lynn? Yes. Um, the sibling carer group isn't just a sibling carer group. It's for any young carers. When we set the group up, um, I did ask colleagues in adult services and um, education provision as well for any to identify any young people that they could see as young carers so that they could be involved in that group and none were identified, but that group is very much open to young carers of adults as well as siblings. Thank you. James? Well, I'm just very encouraged to hear, you know, the word prevention being used as much as support. Um, and also the acknowledgement that obviously this has been an increasing problem. Um, I, you know, I'm not a professional in this area. I don't have the skills required to gauge what is and isn't a mental health issue, but something that's certainly very apparent to me, being an employer of very young people really, many of which just up after school age, um, is an increasing problem probably over the last 15 or 20 years, certainly of people being what I would describe as far more emotionally fragile than they used to be. And we need, I think, to acknowledge that something isn't going quite right within our development of young people, whether it's within the school system, within parenting, or whatever it is. And in the past, when this issue has been addressed, I've always felt that the emphasis is on support. And it's lovely to hear that the word prevention is being used just as much now, and that we've, we're acknowledging that there is an issue, and that we need to put something right. Thank you for that. Are there any further comments? Um, can I just ask, um, it says in this page, you asked if they were represented a professional event, and young people Cornwall have been commissioned to undertake work with children and young people through the Five Islands School. Is that ongoing still, Linda? Have you heard from... No. Is there a survey? Was there a survey? Do we know? Right. That's what that is. That is. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have a recommendation. And should it be the Director of Children's Services or should it be Senior Manager to our community? I think it should be Senior Manager to our community. Hmm. Just to be consistent. Yeah. Um, to act as the name assurer of the CAMS transformation plan. And then two. Can I have a proposal, please? Thank you, Ted. Seconder? Lovely. All in favour, please show. Anybody against? No, that is carried. Thank you very much. We look forward to hearing updates on that one and uh, progress being made. So we now move to item uh, 14, which is review of existing policies. And as I've already said, the one on the gifted and um Talented children has been removed. This is a very brief report, hopefully, Keith. So if you'd like to talk to it. So um, as part of the 
reinvigorated governance structure we're working within. Uh, we have support now to review and uh, bring policies to you on a regular cycle. Uh, I'd like to bring to you two existing policies that uh, have been in place for the last four or five years, one regarding off-island access for children, young people and families, and that's access to activities on St Mary's, which identifies who we will support with regards to boating support and uh, to early years provision, to post-16 provision, school age provision, and identifies the editable journeys that young people can take. And the other policy is the post-16 travel grant policy, which identifies the eligibility factors for young people uh, to be able to access post-16 travel and accommodation to further their studies at mainland school or college. Um, two policies that have been in place uh, over the last three or four years that are both working for us and both robust and both effective that we just bring to you for ratification again. Thank no you very much. No changes made. Yeah. Are there any questions? No, in which case can I have um, a proposal that we ratify um, the post-16 travel grant policy and the off-island boating access policy? Thank you. Thank you. All in favour, please show. Thank you. Anybody again? No, that is carried. That brings us to the end of the um, part one. Uh, we have one item in part two for information only, but well worth a read. So thank you all very much for your time. <coughs> a special thank you to Alison and Colin for coming over from the mainland and spent being with us today. And um, thank you for the children's services team and the finance team for their very comprehensive reports. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.